Western Civ II lecture on imperialism. During the second half of the 19th century, European influence and control over much of the world uh, was expanding. The extension of political, economic, and cultural hegemony uh, by Europeans over other peoples was something that had been building over time. Uh, as in times past, we go back in the distant past, we see that sometimes technological advantages uh, made it possible for one group to have domination over another. Uh, and as we come to the second half of the 19th century, it's uh, industrialization that's the basis of European dominance. Uh, European imperialism had nationalist roots, uh, but it's going to grow in new ways and ultimately produce some very bitter fruits. The church along the way identified with these countries in Europe, sometimes gained opportunities, but as a whole, the efforts of the church were going to be impeded by the church's association with these, natural, the, these national governments. Spain, Portugal, the Netherlands... Uh, had certainly got into exploring the world early on, but as we come to the uh, 19th century, we find that the British and the French are going to eclipse them and uh, uh, develop the largest empires. Germany and Italy, which coalesce and come together as nations later on, uh, are going to find that they're behind uh, and there's not as many opportunities for them, and so they'll get into the uh, acquisition of empire late in the game. So we begin to think about imperialism here. This is going to be something that certainly affects Western civilization for years to come, uh, all the way up into the 20th century until we come to a time period of decolonization and the collapse of empires that we'll talk about after World War II. But... Uh, the foundations for imperialism have their roots going back to the beginning of what we've studied this semester with exploration of the world. Uh, exploration of the world would continue on after those explorations of people like Columbus and then later Magellan and other explorers. Uh, what that those explorations did was it gave them some idea of opportunities as they sailed the ocean, uh, how to get around and where they could get to resources which would be advantageous to them. The scientific quest for knowledge about uh, geography uh, and uh, geology, other natural resources which are in various places, uh, certainly drove things along here. But we'll find that scientific curiosity will come to be very much entangled with uh, nationalistic ambitions. So the Europeans, having superior uh, equipment are going to continue exploring the world as they can sail on ships and then as the technology improves and you have the application of the steam engine uh, to ships then what you're going to have is the ability to cross oceans more quickly and directly and uh, connect with these uh, trading areas and resource areas and markets around the world. Technologically the Europeans had some advances. Uh, they had advantages in the area of agriculture. We've not talked specifically about the new agriculture that's developing and uh, giving them something of an advantage. Uh, but certainly industry is very important and with the addition of steam power, uh, transportation was revolutionized. Uh, communication is shortened. As we get to the uh, second half of the 19th century, we'll find that there will begin to be uh, long-distance communication with telegraph, even as there's transatlantic cables. Some of that will take a long time in coming, but uh, the Europeans have some technological advantages here over persons in other parts of the world. Some of those advantages are in the area of weapons. Uh, as they move from gunpowder weapons, which had provided shock and awe in the time period of the conquest of the Aztecs, uh, they're going to move to having much more deadly accurate weapons. By the time we come to the middle of the uh, the 19th century, you have rifling, which means that you have a, a, a spin in the barrel of a gun, whether it's a cannon or a uh, something that a person can carry. And those, that, that, those grooves that are in the barrel make two and a half turns and put a spin on the projectile that comes out. And what this does is it creates much, much more accurate uh, 
projectile. It's sort of like putting a spin on the football. If a football is thrown, it's a irregularly shaped object, but by putting a spin on it, there's greater accuracy that's obtained. Uh, previous to this, before you had rifling, uh, projectiles flying out the barrel of a gun could go in many different directions. With rifling, they become much, much more accurate. And this is going to give a, uh, uh, a greater capacity to shoot enemies as they're further away. And uh, as they move to mechanizing guns, we're going to find that this is going to give them a uh, greater capacity to overall... Uh, even the 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 bigot the, the most uh, uh, fierce and uh, committed rivals. The Europeans also have some technological advancements in uh, business and all that help have give them some advantages, uh, and uh, certainly in the area of economics. So technological advantages here are going to be at the base of European imperialistic expansion around the world. Uh, certain kinds of know-how and technology are, are critical. And with this comes a sense of superiority when you come across people who don't have the technology that you have. And it feeds into a sense of pride and uh, an idea of superiority that we're better as Europeans and people who are uh, lesser, who don't have the kinds of things we have, don't have the capacity we have. And this is going to allow these European countries to concentrate resources even further and give them an advantage. They're going to be able to, at times, overwhelm uh, local indigenous uh, industries, such as the textile industry in India. Uh, in India, they've long been making their own clothes, but the British textiles are cheaper and superior, and they're made less expensively. And so they're basically going to uh, demolish a very old industry in India. Uh, this will be a symbolic area that much, much later we'll find that uh, uh, Gandhi will take up spinning uh, thread and weaving thread to make cloth as part of his uh, rebellion against the English. We have to wait for a century to get to that material, but we'll come to that at a later time when we see the collapse of empires around the world particularly in the aftermath of World War II. So what motivation is there? Well, motivation for imperialism in Europe is largely dr driven by self-interest and by national interest. Economically, if you're able to dominate an area uh, politically, uh, you're able to control the markets there, you're able to control the uh, social situation there. And so this imperialism is, the, is essentially the practice of domination through military, political, and uh, cultural force. And so the motivation here economically is, if we control this area, we can have access to its resources. We can control those resources. We can keep our enemies from getting to those resources. We also have access to the markets, and we can limit our enemies' access to these markets. And so it's a, a, an entrepreneurial interest that exists there. Now, some people, as they do their calculations, are going to recognize that empire comes at great cost. In order to subjugate people far away and maintain control, it's going to cost a great deal. And so the question will be, will it be viable? Or is it just something that people embark in because of nationalistic pride? What we're going to find is that the Germans are going to be slow to get into this because they've done the calculations and they've calculated that empire will be very, very expensive. Eventually what's going to be found is that when empire is no longer worth it, uh, that the great empires are going to uh, engage in decolonization uh, following World War II. It's because it's just not profitable to try and maintain control over people who always don't want to be ruled over and dominated. People who want to have the same privileges as those back in the home countries. Beyond economic motivations, there's also, also social motivations. This is, uh, as we think about the exploration of the world, as the English go with people like Captain Cook, uh, 
exploring the South Pacific. They discover places like New Zealand and uh, explore around the coast of Australia. Well, in Australia, for example, it's a place where they can provide an alleviation of a growing population of people back in England. And with that very low population density in Australia, it's a place where you can also get rid of undesirable people. Uh, many of the people who go from England to Australia will be sent there as part of a penal colony where they're either debtors or people who are in trouble with the law otherwise who are going to be exported, if you will, um, to this place where they can pursue their dreams. So it could provide this kind of benefit. One of the problems, though, is going to be that most immigrants, as we look at the uh, history of Europe here in the late 19th century, don't go to areas that their country particularly controls. Okay, With the British, they do have people going to Australia and New Zealand. They have people going to Southern Africa, which they control. But uh, we're also going to see that the Irish are going to move in droves to the United States. Uh, we'll find that many, many Germans and Italians are going to immigrate to the United States in the second half of the 19th century. Another motivation for imperialism would be political. It provides your nation with status. Uh, it comes to be assumed that this is what great nations would do, and we're going to find that the French and the British are going to uh, continue to expand empire for some time. Uh, this is a way that they can compete with each other without being directly at war with each other as France goes to control much of North Africa. Uh, Britain is going to expand around the world in a variety of places, but particularly in Southern Africa, uh, where they can have resources and markets that they can control. When we come to 1795, what we'll find is the English will seize South Africa because it's a strategic uh, area as ships have to go around the Cape of Good Hope and they haven't yet built the Suez Canal so they can bypass going around Africa. And so sometimes, you know, seizing territory and claiming empire is a strategic move. You want to control a place where you can provide uh, resources to ships that you are looking to sail around the world. Uh, the same will happen then later on in 1882 when the English are going to establish a protectorate in Egypt. It's in their strategic interest uh, to control that area. As people uh, pursue these motivations, some of them come about because of philosophy. Now, we've said before that the Europeans are developing a sense of superiority. Uh, this is going to come in a number of different directions. Some of it's going to be philosophical. Um, some people believe that you, what you have here is a uh, evolutionary rise of the uh, most advanced and they ought to be the ones that dominate and uh, those that are inferior need to le either get with it or uh, understand their place. Uh, in America what we'll find is that uh, there's also a religious aspect of this where people sometimes get to thinking that uh, they're there to serve divine purposes. In America, there's a widespread notion here as we come to the second half of the uh, 19th century in manifest destiny that America has a place in the world to spread its way of life and its economy uh, and raise others to share its values. Uh, this is something that the British also had. They were instruments of divine purpose to... Uh, uh, spread Christianity and to uh, raise the well-being of people uh, throughout the world uh, to improve their lives uh, through their embrace of European culture and religion. So as we think about the uh, philosophical motivations, certainly social Darwinianism is going to support uh, imperialism uh, on the one side, but then we'll find that uh, Amongst Christians, there's the idea that we're doing this for the benefit of others. So it's a humanitarian thing, uh, an altruistic type of thing. This is reflected in a poem written by the famous English writer Rudyard Kipling. Perhaps some of you might have uh, 
uh, watched a movie, The Jungle Book, with Mowgli at some time. Uh, others of you who are more uh, intrepid readers might have read uh, his work, Kim, talking about Africa, not Africa, talking about India also. But perhaps the most familiar would be the story of Rikitiki Tavi. Uh, stories that are told that came out of uh, areas of the British Empire, particularly in India. But Kipling wasn't only in India. He's going to travel around the British Empire, and his he's going to write a, a, a poem in 1899 entitled The White Man's Burden. In this, we see something of his idea of altruism, that this business of taking on empire is a burden to carry. So let me read for you his... Uh, his poem, The White Man's Burden. It came out in 1899. Uh, just to give you a little bit of context, in this poem he's essentially chiding Americans, calling them to take up their responsibility to acquire empire. America at this point in time has been satisfied with having something of a area of economic interest in South America. What we saw back in uh, the beginning of the 19th century was the Monroe Doctrine, which under which President Monroe says that uh, you know we're going to keep these European powers out of this sphere of influence here in South America, and as a result of some American support, what we're going to find is there's a number of countries that uh, break away from colonial overlords at that point in time. So America is not going to have a uh, set of colonies and an empire in South America, but economically we're going to move towards dominating that region but in 1899 as spain has become weak and its uh, empire has fallen apart uh, they've lost control of it not just south america but also uh, the area of the philippines in the pacific and the americans have come to uh, take up an interest in the philippines and what, he, what Rudyard Kipling is essentially telling Americans is it's time for you to grow up as a nation and take on responsibilities. Be an adult nation and quit being little kids. Let me read this poem for you. Take up the white man's burden. Send forth the best you breed. Go bind your sons to exile to serve your captives' need. To wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild. Your new-caught sullen peoples half devil and half child. Take up the white man's burden, in patience to abide, to veil the threat of terror and check the show of pride, by open speech and simple and hundred times made plain, to seek another's profit and work another's gain. Take up the white man's burden, the savage wars of peace, fill full the mouth of famine and bid the sickness cease. And when your goal is nearest, an end for others sought, watch sloth and heathen folly bring all your hopes to naught. Take up the white man's burden, no tawdry rule of kings, but toil of surf and sweeper, the tale of common things. The ports ye shall not enter, the roads ye shall not tread, go mark them with your living, and mark them with your dead. Take up the white man's burden, and reap his old reward. The blame of those ye better, the hate of those ye guard, the cry of hosts ye humor, ah, slowly toward the light. Why brought he thus from bondage, our beloved Egyptian knight? Take up the white man's burden, you dare not stoop to less, nor call too loud on freedom, or cloak your weariness. By all ye cry or whisper, by all ye leave or do, the sullen, silent peoples shall weigh your gods and you. Take up the white man's burden, have done with childish days, the lightly proffered laurel, the easy ungrudged praise, comes now to search your manhood, through all the thankless years, cold-edged with dear-bought wisdom, the judgment of your peers. This poem by the British uh, imperialist Kipling is calling Americans to take up empire and to do their dirt, their duty in the Philippines and to do their duty in places uh, like the Caribbean where they have a great deal of influence. What he's suggesting is that in the first uh, part there that you send the best you have into exile to serve your captives. 
the way he characterizes your subject people is that they're half devil and half child. They're not going to appreciate what you've come there to do. But you need to be patient in spite of all the, the, the danger. Uh, you're there to benefit somebody else. He sees imperialism as working for the benefit of the subject people. This is your job, to take up this battle, to fill the mouth of famine. You know, you're going to help provide better agricultural resources and keep people from starving to death. You're going to bring better medicine to bid sickness to, to cease. You're going to struggle real hard, and yet you're going to be frustrated at times because you're going to watch these people who have different ideas about work uh, sometimes neglect those investments that you make in them. As you go, you're going to mark your trail here with your living and your dead. You need to understand that in places like Africa, uh, there's high mortality rate as Europeans go there. Uh, as they encounter tropical diseases, particularly those brought on by vectors like mosquitoes, uh, they oftentimes die within days of arriving. And so by going and sending the best that you breed, these young intrepid uh, people off to other parts of the world, uh, they may die of disease. Uh, they're going to die as uh, uh, martyrs for the cause of these people who don't really appreciate them coming. Uh, they're going to go off these foreign countries and die away from home. But uh, this is what you're called to do. These people, all sometimes they want to stay in bondage, but uh, you're, you're going to liberate them from what they've been experiencing, uh, what they're experiencing here. But as you do this, you know, this is a great challenge. Uh, and if you fail to do this, they're going to judge you and your God in the future. And so basically you need to get busy with this, grow up and, uh, Otherwise, other nations are going to find you Americans to be uh, a juvenile, silly little people who don't take responsibilities uh, that you should be taking on in the world for a country as big as you are with the resources that you have. So this, this poem immediately gets uh, some interesting uh, responses. Uh, the, uh, the, the call is going to be to... Uh, take up the white man's burden. There are going to be some people in Europe who want to do this. Uh, and so what we're going to find is that there's going to be a push to uh, get Americans involved in some circles. What we'll find is that there'll be a push, particularly in America, to drive towards building things like the Panama Canal and taking over uh, the Philippines and ruling over the Phil Philippines. And uh, it's going to come at a cost. Now, in response to uh, Kipling's poem, you have Henry Le Boucher, who wrote The Brown Man's Burden. Uh, he sees things from the perspective of the subject people rather than from a British perspective. So it makes an interesting uh, uh, contrast. So he's playing very clearly off of Kipling's poem as he writes... Pile on the brown man's burden to gratify your greed. Go clear away the niggers who progress would impede. Be very stern, for truly, tis useless to be mild, with new-caught sullen ch peoples, half devil and half child. Pile on the brown man's burden, and if you rouse his hate, meet his old-fashioned reasons with maxims up to date. With shells and dum dumb bullets, a hundred times made plain, the brown man's loss must ever imply the white man's gain. Pile on the brown man's burden, compel him to be free. Let all your manifestos reek with philanthropy. And if the heathen folly, he dares your will dispute, then in the name of freedom don't hesitate to shoot. Pile on the brown man's burden, and if his cry be sore, that surely need not irk you, you've driven slaves before. Seize on his ports and pastures, the fields his people tread. Go make from them your living, and mark them with his dead. Pile on the brown man's burden, and through the world proclaim that you are freedom's agent. There's no more paying game. And should your own past history straight to your teeth be thrown, retort that independence is good for whites alone. So, uh, 
I'm sorry, I, I, I got the last part there. I went on to another poem that I want to get to here a little bit later. So, um, the brown man's burden is one that uh, is going to be uh, uh, problematic. What he sees uh, is that uh, they're going to be oppressed. Now, there are a couple of allusions there that uh, you might miss along the way. Again, a lot of that just takes uh, Kipling's poem and turns it upside down. But uh, when you meet uh, the opposition of the brown man with maxims up to date, uh, this is not a maxim as in some sort of saying. Uh, that's a maxim gun. As we come to the, the uh, end of the 19th century, there they've developed uh, early machine guns. The maxim is a machine gun. And then you find a reference to shells and dum dum bullets. Uh, the shells would be bullets that are in metal uh, cartridges as opposed to paper cartridges uh, that can feed into these machine guns. And then dum-dum bullets. Now, uh, we might have smart bombs today, but uh, a dum-dum bullet is one that has been dum dum It's basically a uh, soft lead bullet that is uh, marked so that when it hits a body, it basically causes greater carnage. Uh, so you could take the soft lead bullet, for example, you might have on a 22 that you, you might have at your home. And if you would take a knife and cut the uh, projectile, uh, it would make it dummied, as they would say. So when it hits, it's going to break apart and cause greater carnage, or it could tumble inside the body of your enemy and cause uh, greater damage. So that's what's talking about dum dum bullets there. Um, I don't think there's too much else there that I read that you might not understand. So not everybody's going to agree with Kipling that, uh, you know, it's such a noble thing to embark on spreading empire and, and improving things for people. Uh, not everybody agrees that your ways are superior. You may see them as being superior, but not everybody's going to see your ways as being superior. And so as you push your values upon others, they're going to resist. And uh, you may think that it may benefit them, but uh, it's going to cost you something in response. Another area that uh, we find in promoting imperialism is going to be in the area of religion. There are a number of religious uh, missions groups that get started. In England, we've spoken briefly before of the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel, uh, under which the Wesley brothers went out to the colony of Georgia. Uh, something that will follow soon on that is Society for the Promotion of Christian Knowledge, uh, which will export uh, theological libraries to places like the Americas and uh, will continue as a publishing house for a long, long time into the 20th century and uh, the SPCK still exists today uh, but uh, William Carey will write a thesis in 1792 an inquiry into the obligation for winning the heathen Basically, what he's going to conclude in his thesis is that we should use every means possible to win the lost. This is founded upon uh, the Great Commission that Jesus gives to his disciples. And if we're going to be disciples, we need to use every means possible, even the new technologies that are coming along here. And uh, under the auspices of the British Missionary Society, uh, he will go to the new British colonies in India. Now, as he goes there, he's going to find that he's not always welcomed by the, the British. They don't want him to come because uh, he's going to uh, cause them, you know, if you have this clergyman there, he's going to restrict some of the things they might do to the local inhabitants. So he's going to end up settling in Serampore, where the, there's a Danish uh, colony. And uh, while he's there, he's going to certainly make sacrifices as his wife is uh, going to eventually die there. Uh, but he's going to spend long years there uh, working against the uh, European colonial powers at times. But he's going to translate uh, the Bible into uh, local language. He's going to do linguistic studies. It's a long-term process. He's going to uh, 
uh, trained Christian leaders and uh, in many ways set the stage for modern missions. He's sometimes recognized as the father of modern missions where he's gone out in faith uh, to India and he's ready to give his life and uh, he's going to inspire many people to follow in his train to come out to India. There will be others who go out into other parts of the world. Uh, another organization that gets started soon after this is the London Missionary Society. Uh, the most famous missionary probably who goes out with the London Missionary Society is going to be David Livingston. Now there are those who go out before him, uh, like David Livingston's father-in-law, uh, Robert Moffat. Uh, they're going to follow similar, similar sorts of strategies in trying to uh, win people in that they're going to be uh, learning local languages and trying to communicate the gospel in local languages. Uh, this is nothing that's particularly new. But having these missionary societies, this is something that's new. Uh, and th seeing this as being something of a national obligation, what we're going to find is that different countries with their state churches are going to uh, use this as part of their justification for their imperialistic domination of various people groups. We're doing it for their good, and particularly we're bringing the gospel. We're making it safe for missionaries to go to a particular place. Uh, typically, though, nationalism gets tied up with this, and so as a result, it'll only be uh, missionaries from the state church of the dominating imperial power, which will have access uh, to an area. So where the French are dominant, Protestant missionaries are not welcome. Where the English are dominant, they're not as interested in Catholic missionaries. <coughs> so, um, we're going to find that uh, there's a number of efforts that are undertaken. Some of them are going to be much more uh, successful than others. Some are going to be uh, very poor efforts. David Livingston is going to uh, generate a great deal of uh, attention uh, as he goes on uh, his missionary explorations. He's going to spend some time as a missionary. He, he's a Scotsman who uh, has grown up in a, a relatively modest kind of context, uh, done training to be something of a doctor, and he's going to go under the auspices of the London Missionary Society to South Africa, and there he's going to work with Moffat and eventually marry Moffat's daughter. Uh, near the Orange River in uh, South Africa. In time, he'll expand beyond the mission station that Moffat's created. This seems to be the strategy that they develop, where they develop a mission station, and uh, converts come into that mission station, and uh, sometimes are attracted by the benefits of technological advantages they may have there. Uh, eventually, David Livingston is go, going to go on explorations beyond the mission station and uh, go explore in the modern-day country of Botswana. And by 1850s, is going to discover Victoria Falls, where the Zambezi River falls over an escarpment. And uh, he'll name it after the Good Queen uh, back in England. And he's going to do some explorations where he's going to travel uh, across Africa, across Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, going between Mozambique and Angola. So he's going to walk across Africa and he's going to get a great deal of attention as an explorer who's able to report to the Royal Geographical Society back in England when he travels back there about his discoveries. But he basically wants to use the three C's to advance the situation in Africa. He wants to advance Christianity and he's going to do that through commerce and civilization. He basically believes that if you're able to bring uh, commerce to Africa, it's going to be a civilizing effect and open the door to Christianity. So these three C's are his strategies. Now, David Livingston is famous as a missionary, but as far as effectiveness, uh, as far as I can tell from reading his works, he basically has one convert in all of his years as a missionary, and his convert eventually apostatizes. So he's not very good as a preacher in Africa, as far as not very effective, uh, but he is going to be somebody who inspires a whole generation of others to follow in his wake. So hundreds of people are going to follow in his wake. Some of them are going to adopt something of his strategy. They're not going to differentiate Christianity 
from their culture and their economic situation. They see all that as coming together as a package. Others will be able to differentiate something of this. Livingston's going to be horrified by the slave trade that's continuing in East Africa and uh, work to uh, oppose that. Again, sometimes he has some interesting uh, collaborators who assist him with some things, so he's going to work at times with slave traders. But uh, this is one of the things that he's working against in East Africa, where eventually he will die. But as he goes exploring Africa, he's gained a great deal of attention, and he's discovered the Zambezi River and knows that it falls over Victoria Falls. But he hasn't covered the course otherwise. What he believes is the Great Zambezi River would be an avenue for commerce. And so as a result, he's going to raise money for a steamship that he will use to go up the Zambezi River. Now, the course of the Zambezi dumps out in what we know today as Mozambique on the east coast of Africa. So he's able to raise money for a steamship, and they, they sail up the Zambezi River. The problem is it's got a fairly strong current, and so at this point in time, steamships aren't exactly moving along forward like a jet boat might today. Uh, today, you can go much further up the Zambezi River than the steamship that he brings will ever go up. So he's got aspirations of going up. Uh, what he's recognized is a couple of things that are going to open the doors for others. And one is that at higher altitudes in Africa, there's less of a mosquito problem. And mosquitoes are particularly a problem because they uh, carry malaria. Uh, malaria is a uh, uh, infection that people get through mosquito bites that leads to very high fevers. Uh, these very high fevers oftentimes will take people's fevers over 104 degrees. And as you get to 105 degrees, you have brain damage that's caused. And so they, it can leave people debilitated if they survive. It can kill people. So what he's discerned is that if you go to higher elevations, there aren't as many mosquitoes. And in East Africa, there's areas of very high elevation. So Europeans could survive there longer and use that as a base for evangelism. He's also discovered that if you do get malaria, uh, you can reduce the impact of these fevers by taking quinine. Now, most of you probably haven't had, ever had too much quinine before. Uh, probably the closest that you've come to tasting quinine is uh, if at uh, the holidays here you might have uh, a taste of squirt soda. Sort of one of those citrus sodas that's used as a mixer for various uh, punches and the like. Uh, if you look in the ingredients you'll find that what gives it that bitter taste is quinine. quinine. Uh, it's very very bitter and uh, yet what he discovers is that if you use quinine, you can reduce the impact of these fevers. Uh, for myself, I can say that uh, I took something called Derechloroquinine, which was a, uh, a medicine during my 10 years as a boy in Africa. I never suffered from malaria, even though I lived in areas where there was malaria. I certainly was bitten by mosquitoes plenty of times, but I've never suffered malaria because I took an anti-malarial pill every week. Uh, it was a terrible pill to swallow. You basically held it in your teeth and you tried for it not to touch your tongue. And uh, usually I tried to take it with milk so that it would uh, kind of be covered with a little something. And uh, it was uh, a Saturday night rite of passage to try and get that pill swallowed without it touching your tongue and being so terribly bitter. But the uh, alternative uh, would have been to risk death. A lot of missionaries are going to be saved by this discovery, uh, at least saved physically. Uh, they may lose their lives in other ways, uh, as there are some perils which might exist. Livingston's discoveries are going to help to open up the door and inspire others along the way. But his, his efforts at trying to bring uh, his way of life from Scotland into Africa are going to be frustrated. Because as you go up the Zambezi River, uh, you reach a place where the river is constrained within a gorge and the current is very strong as you come to the area today where they built the Kaborabasa dam you have rapids and the steamship couldn't get make past the rapids and so the Zambezi river is not a way into the hinter parts of Africa 
that can be accessed by steamship. The area, the country of Malawi, uh, just north of the area of Mozambique, uh, is an area that particularly remembers David Livingston, as their capital city is named Blantyre after his hometown in Scotland. And uh, sometimes it's been uh, connected in significant ways uh, to. England and uh, to David Livingston's life. Another capital city in the area is the capital city of Zambia. Uh, the capital city there is Livingston, so it's named after uh, David Livingston. There's something of a uh, interesting relationship between Africa and Africans today and David Livingston. Uh, he's seen as a person who certainly opened up the way for uh, European settlement in Africa and colonial domination on the one side, but yet on the other, he was something of a champion of Africans who opposed the Arab uh, enslavement of uh, Africans from the east coast of Africa and who helped to motivate the abolition movement in England to uh, use the British Navy to try to cut off the slave trade that the Arabs were uh, conducting out of Zanzibar. So David Livingston is one of these people who's gone out for the sake of the name of Christ, but at the same time combined that with his culture and has not always differentiated uh, Christianity from the culture around him. Uh, just to finish up here with David Livingston, in his last uh, trip, he goes out and he's been lost for some time. There's been no contact with him. And so there comes to be a concern for him. Other explorers have been lost, and there have been rescue expeditions that are sent out. Uh, so eventually a fellow by the name of Stanley, will, he's a newspaper reporter, will go out looking for Livingston. And in 1871, uh, we'll find him uh, there in central sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, as these are the only two European men for hundreds of miles, uh, it's oftentimes seen to be rather quaint and very Victorian and formal as uh, uh, Henry Stanley uh, takes off his pith helmet and walks towards uh, uh, David Livingston and says, uh, Dr. Livingston, I presume. Uh, Dr. Livingston certainly plays a role in motivating missionaries, uh, but many of them are going to come with this idea that they have a civilizing mission uh, and thinking that their cultural ways are in every way superior to those of the local populace. This will be an ongoing issue between uh, Christian missionaries and people who live in various parts of the world because what we recognize is that the world is afflicted by sin and cultures are snared in some uh, sometimes very ghastly cultural practices that uh, don't recognize that people are made in the image of God and uh, there's some uh, great inhumanities that are perpetrated uh, by various cultures. And we're going to find that Christian missionaries are going to find themselves at odds sometimes with the culture of their target audience. And they're going to have to deal with those issues. As we think about imperialism, uh, it certainly has something of a negative tone. Traditionally for Americans, we don't like to think of ourselves as being imperialistic. Although many other people in the world would say that America continues to maintain something of an empire today and they're concerned about cultural imperialism uh, as we move to be more globalized. But as people assess imperialism, certainly we can also see uh, some positive results. One thing that happens is that there's an expansion of global economy. Uh, there come to be exotic products, which are in other parts of the world, which come to be available in markets where people desire them. And that provides resources for people back in the countries where these things were obtained. And so we're going to find that there's mahogany furniture that's uh, uh, highly desirable that's used in the United States and in England uh, from woods that come from other places. That puts people to work. But on the other side, uh, negatively, we might see that there could be some uh, devastation of, in, of environment and economic exploitation that can take place. Uh, everybody who's working doesn't always benefit, uh, but money is certainly being made, and the global economy is growing. 
There's also the spread of science and technology. People who live in faraway places learn about European technology. Sometimes they're going to keep that to themselves, uh, but they might well benefit from having new resources available to them uh, to move from using stone axes to using uh, steel axes. Certainly you can chop down trees more quickly. You can build houses more effectively. You can uh, hoe your crops that you're growing uh, more effectively with such tools. So tools are going to be an important uh, item, a technological item, but uh, uh, even just in the spread of information, as people are going to translate uh, spoken languages into written languages and uh, things are going to be preserved that otherwise might have been forgotten as they're written and published. Um, there are a lot of uh, organizations like that uh, Royal Society uh, or the French Academy that continue to exist and they're trying to advance the state of human knowledge in the world and certainly there's going to be a great deal of ethnological discoveries that are made as far as how people live in various places and uh, people can learn from some of those strategies to adapt some of their uh, learned uh, strategies for subsistence in various places how do you get to certain resources what kind of uh, resources are there and what might be perceived as an empty land otherwise so we'll see the development of uh, raw resources through primary industry, uh, where they're going to extract uh, things from places, again, like the timber I mentioned, or uh, metal sources. Uh, this will drive exploration as people are looking for gold, uh, for example, um, looking for minerals that are useful um, for the growing uh, metallurgical industries in, in Europe. There will be an increased food supply that comes about as there's a diversification of crops as crops are uh, exported to new places. Um, there's going to be uh, jobs created at times where the environmental context allows certain kinds of crops to be grown in one place. Um, what we're going to see with imperialism is that there's going to be the abolition of slavery as the British are going to abolish slavery in their empire eventually they'll buy out uh, slavers, uh, people who own slaves, slave owners in British held territories, and uh, they'll use their navy to stop this abominable practice of trafficking in humans. Uh, they'll even take that opposition to slavery and using their navy uh, into the east coast of Africa where they don't have much in the way of economic interests. And certainly they'll use their uh, uh, the, these empires do help to advance Christianity in some ways. Uh, certainly it provides an opening, it pr protects missionaries in places, but uh, we'll find that there's also negatives. Uh, as we think about the negatives of imperialism, uh, the, there certainly is economic exploitation that takes place. Uh, and uh, where people are, uh, their, their, their geographical settings are just plundered and left ruined uh, when there's mining and uh, various poisonous chemicals are used in extraction of gold ore and it contaminates the land. That still goes on in places today uh, where people exploit situations and don't think about their obligations to those people who follow behind them. Uh, there will be control of markets uh, where sometimes people are forced to buy more expensive goods from far away than those that might have been grown locally. There certainly will be uh, political repression uh, as aspirations for independence will be crushed by colonial armies that have uh, superior weaponry. There will be cultural animosity that uh, arises between people. They don't speak the same language. That's a critical difference. They don't understand each other. They don't necessarily sh share the same ideas as far as work ethic goes. When does one work? 
who does certain sorts of work. In some cultures, certain types of work are for people of one gender or the other. Uh, some work is for people who have different castes or different uh, social status. And Europeans come along and they trample roughshod over some of the long established cultural practices. Uh, there's some of those practices that uh, just have to do with aesthetics uh, that people are going to be opposing. In India, we'll find that people like Kerry are going to oppose the practice of sati. Uh, this is where the expectation is that the widow of a dead man will throw herself onto his burning funeral pyre. And if she doesn't throw herself on, then others might throw her on for her uh, because she's just going to be a liability to the family afterwards. Well... Uh, the Christians find this to be an abominable practice. We'll find as we move into the 20th century that missionaries are going to come and to have opposition in other places at other times. We'll talk about China here a little bit later, but in China, the, aesthetically, small feet are seen to be beautiful. So uh, little girls are subjected to foot binding, something that's excruciatingly painful to prevent the, the, uh, the foot of a child from growing. And then subsequently, uh, having to walk around in tiny little feet, uh, not having great stability in the years that come. So it's cruciating pain that's created just because of this aesthetic that small feet make you beautiful, and if you're beautiful with small feet, then you can marry better. Um, these are just a couple of examples of some cultural things that Christians uh, get involved with, and sometimes the missionaries are going to get involved with uh, cultural tensions. Now, as they come along with the protection of the colonial power, and they may have schools, they may want to teach your children something, but they'll teach them the Bible. And uh, they'll teach you that the old gods are not real gods at all. Uh, we're going to find there gets to be a confusion sometimes between uh, the Europeans' religion and the Europeans' government. Some people will acquiesce and go along with the culturally and politically dominant situation. They'll embrace and enculturate. Others are going to engage in resistance. And so as we think about uh, examples of uh, uh, imperialism, uh, we see this particularly taking place in Africa, uh, in what's sometimes known as the scramble for Africa. European powers get into the scramble for Africa where they're in a race to try and plant their flag and claim territories around Africa. Previously, they'd been content with um, trading posts along the coast, but you know they come to realize that there's resources to be exploited and markets to be exploited on the interlands, and uh, so as a result, Europeans are going to get into a great race for Africa, and the French are going to pretty much claim North Africa and the British Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, there'll be some small territories in what comes to be known as Tanganyika or Tanzania today and Namibia where the Germans are going to gain some territories late in the game and they'll also get a claim on Cameroon uh, but uh, pretty much the French are going to get most of North Africa and the British uh, Southern Africa but the British are going to have aspirations uh, to enlarge their territories uh, the classic example of an imperialist will be a fellow by the name of Cecil John Rhodes, who is going to be famous for his efforts with the De Beers Diamond Company. Uh, some of you might know De Beers is a company that sells diamonds. Uh, it's a, a company that is basically drawn its name from a old volcanic plug where they discovered that there in that distinctive uh, rock that there were diamonds and uh, working from that part of Africa over towards Johannesburg there's great gold mines there in what's known as the Rand and uh, uh, the British uh, local company uh, is going to decide to expand northward and as they expand northward into more gold fields what is known today as Zimbabwe uh, they're going to find it advantageous to control uh, the uh, people of that land and rule over them. Cecil John Rhodes is the consummate uh, uh, imperialist. He will eventually have uh, a couple of countries named after him. The country of Rhodesia, 
Uh, you have northern and southern Rhodesia is known, and they later come to be the countries of Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe and Zambia. Uh, he wants to paint the map British red, and he envisions a day when there'll be a British road that goes from Cape Town in the south point of Africa all the way up to Cairo in North Africa. And uh, what we'll find is that following World War I, the British dream comes close to reality. Uh, for myself, I lived for 10 years in the country of Zimbabwe. It was then known as Rhodesia when I was there. And I lived in the town of Fort Victoria. Fort Victoria is located along uh, one of Cecil John Rhodes' great dreams, the Great North Road. Again, this would be the road that would go from Cape Town to Cairo. Uh, it was never completed, uh, and uh, there still aren't great... Uh, roads built across Africa, but uh, in Southern Africa, uh, the Great North Road uh, does provide greater access than many other places in the continent, uh, even though it's just a two-lane road. Uh, you can move rather quickly through portions of that, through South Africa and then Zimbabwe. So in Africa, we find that there's going to be uh, imperialistic seizure of uh, territories from people who don't have uh, guns, but it comes sometimes with great opposition. There are going to be people who try to resist. Uh, sometimes, though, the superior technology is going to lead to great carnage. Uh, when the Zulu uh, resist the, the British, and the Zulu have a very uh, committed war force under Shaka Zulu, uh, but they have uh, very deadly stabbing spears. If they get in close, uh, they're going to disembowel you. But when you have guns that can shoot through oxide shields, and you have machine guns that shoot at a sufficient rate of power, uh, rate of fire, uh, oxide shields and assegais uh, don't succeed. And the British are going to crush attempts to uh, resist uh, their domination. When Cecil John Rhodes and others go into Zimbabwe, uh, They'll be opposed by the Matabele, uh, relatives of the Zulu, and uh, they'll crush opposition from the local inhabitants and establish a, uh, a government in the name of His Majesty, His Britannic Majesty, sorry, Her Britannic Majesty, first of all here, and then eventually the subsequent kings of England. In Asia, there are also uh, examples of imperialism where we're going to find there's going to be resistance uh, again, the European powers will go in. The French will claim territories in uh, uh, Southeast Asia. The British are going to claim territories. And so they're going to have territories in India and Burma and Pakistan. Uh, they're not the only ones engaged in imperialism. We'll find also that the Japanese are going to have aspirations for uh, territorial enlargement also. Uh, but the Europeans here in Western society, what we're going to find is that uh, there's going to be some resistance. In the area of China, uh, China is never politically taken over by European powers, but they're able to force their way so that the Chinese, who initially are resistant to the coming of Europeans, are going to accept British merchants and other European merchants who have ports that they can come and call at. Uh, the Chinese emperors recognize that all of the trade that's brought by the British isn't necessarily beneficial. One of the things the British bring from the area of Pakistan and India and Afghanistan is opiates. They bring opium. And the British are going to go to war with the, uh, uh, with the Chinese over keeping their ports open and having superior gunpowder powder weapons and cannons. They're going to be able to force their way into these markets and guarantee that their markets will be open uh, to European export of this drug that's uh, destroying Chinese society. Uh, but there's too many profits there. So uh, this isn't a terribly noble time here for the British or Americans who are engaged in the opium trade. Uh, in response, what we're going to find is that they will have uh, some resistant to your Euro Europeans in what's known as the Boxer Rebellion, where there'll be attempts to 
uh, kill foreigners, and this will include missionaries uh, who've come in because they're identified with the oppressors. And so there'll be something of a nationalistic uh, uh, resistance in places uh, like China. There'll be resistance in other places as well. But the technological edge the Europeans have is uh, essentially insurmountable. Some people will just embrace European culture and acquiesce to what goes on. Uh, as we think about responses, we saw the response of the Browns man's burden. Uh, another response, a, a negative response to uh, imperialism is seen in the writing of C.E.D. Phelps, who wrote also in 1903 in a uh, journal called City and State, he wrote The Burden of Profit. In The Burden of Profit, he says, take up the white man's burden. The white man is the strong and glorious Anglo-Saxon who feels not others wrong. All men are black whose customs he does not understand. Take up the white man's burden, the gold fields of the Rand. Take up the white man's burden, the dwelling of the brown. Perchance will yield a profit when you have swept them down. By treason or by torture, mean stealth or open war, take up the white man's burden, Manila and Samar. Take up the white man's burden when he is wanting land. And should your own past history straight in your teeth be thrown retort that independence is good for whites alone so clearly he doesn't think imperialism is uh, all good and that uh, domination of other people is a, a good idea uh, and so what we're finding here is that in response to imperialism there's certainly the uh, there's responses on the part of uh, the oppressed but even amongst oppressors, we're finding that humanitarians, uh, many of them who are Christians, are, are wanting to urge restraint in these colonies where laws would protect the rights of the uh, persons who are ruled and that they would gain uh, greater participation in government. Now, not every uh, people group is going to aspire to do that. We're going to find amongst the British that there's some... Uh, aspiration to elevate uh, the lot of their subjects. Uh, some others are not going to embark in that same uh, focus. They're going to be more exploitative. So as we look at the Portuguese colonies, uh, we're going to find that they don't invest nearly so much in their colonies as the British do. But what the British are going to find eventually is that it just gets to be too expensive to maintain this. Uh, there are going to be some great atrocities that happen in uh, India, where a relatively small force of British will have the support of some uh, of the cultural elites in India, and they'll be able to suppress uprisings against uh, the British. And that will last all the way up until uh, 1948, when eventually India will be given their independence. So as we think about the impact of imperialism, certainly the impact oftentimes we might say might be other places, but there's also an impact on the countries that did send out uh, colonizers who dominated people in other parts of the world. Today, if you would go to London, what you're gonna find is that uh, if you wanna have something cheap to eat, uh, there's lots and lots of curry places from Pakistani and Indian immigrants to uh, to India, uh, from India, sorry, to Britain. And uh, there's a taste for curry. Now, if you go to uh, uh, India, you're going to probably be hard pressed to find curry powder. It's a combination of spices uh, that uh, is a classic combination, but in uh, in England, this will be something that they sell as a something that's already combined for you. You don't make your own curry. Uh, you're going to buy a powder that's pre-mixed for you. Uh, but you know, there's going to be uh, many people who are going to move around the world, and there's going to be uh, cultural exchange that takes place. 
some some that will be uh, in the area of culinary things uh, but as you think about imperialism you know what else uh, what kind of continuing connections are there what we find is that there are some countries where as you travel around the world the old language of the imperial power continues to be used if you go to Ghana in West Africa a country uh, not too much different in size from uh, North Carolina here uh, what you'd find is that uh, there are 60 different languages in that country and so English serves as something of the uh, the main trade language the language of commerce uh, if you go to India people speak English they've done all their secondary school training in English and the result is perhaps when you call uh, to your computer help desk you get assistance in India who uh, speak English perhaps better English than what you speak uh, so languages have been taken around the world and uh, sometimes there's cultural things that are adopted uh, if you go to India uh, you're going to find that uh, certainly people drink tea but they're going to enjoy tea as the British enjoy tea uh, you're going to have milk in your tea so the British uh, are going to adopt some things from uh, you know tea is something of a, a foreign commodity that they bring back with them and coffee uh, if you go to England today tea time is a standard activity uh, they've anglicized it in some ways uh, perhaps what you eat with your tea you might have a uh, you might have clotted cream with your uh, scones but uh, you know tea is something of a addiction that uh, comes out of the east here uh, that uh, is learned by these British as they get caffeine that way and uh, there's interesting cultural exchanges back and forth amongst people in the area of food but also there's exchanges in the areas of ideas and technology so as you do your discussion this week I'd like you to think about uh, the impact of imperialism and the continuing impact from the uh, time period of the mid and late 19th century on the world in which we live today how much is your life impacted by those old imperialistic aspirations of those nations of Europe back in the 19th century and afterwards? Thank you for your attention.